Hello, and welcome back to the Adventurer's Pack. I'm Scott. And I'm Emmy. And today we're taking a first look at the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, which is the newest book for D&D 5th edition. It is a complete campaign setting. Wildmount is a continent within the greater planet of Exandria, which is the campaign setting created by Matt Mercer and the team at Critical Role. And Wildmount is the specific continent where Critical Role Season 2 takes place. So if you've been interested in having your own players or your own characters adventure within this realm, this is the supplement that you want to pick up. This is not a book for uh, running the exact adventure that Critical Role has been running on their show. This is simply um, the world itself or the continent itself, much like Eberron uh, or Ravnica. That is the sort of book that we are looking at now. Now, it's very important going forward at this point in the video that we're not going to sit here and talk a lot about Season 2 of Critical Role, but there still might be some, if not spoilers, something that kind of walks the line. There is discussion of events and places and people that if you want to experience it for the first time, watching Critical Role, if you're not caught up or if you've been wanting to watch it, maybe stop here just because some of that might be discussed as it's in the book. And if you're not worried about that sort of thing, there's a lot of material in here that I'm very excited to get into. Uh, I know that when this book was first announced, there was a little bit of give and take online about some people saying, hey, we only get X number of books per year. Why do are we going to get this one? Why couldn't it be something else? Um, I know I wasn't that worried when it was announced. No. And honestly, now that we've gotten the book, um, all of the worries I didn't have are even pushed farther yeah. away. Uh, this is fantastic uh, and has a lot of material even for just homebrew campaigns. Oh, absolutely. I think for me, the Echo Knight, which is a new subclass for the fighter, it is worth the price alone. So mm, if that's... I mean, if that's the most you get out of this book, then it's still really good. But honestly, there's so much more to dig into than just that. It's a really fun campaign setting. Yeah, so this has been broken into uh, seven very dense chapters. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. So chapter one starts us off with the history of Wildmount. Now, there is going to be a little bit of overlap information here with another supplement that was released, which is the Tal'Dorei campaign setting. Now, Tal'Dorei is another continent in this world of Exandria. Now, this other book that was released uh, wasn't an official D&D book. However, I highly recommend it. It has a lot of great information in there and is a perfect companion to Wildmount. I know a major place, at least where I saw a lot of overlap, was in this description of one of the biggest events that shaped this whole planet, which is known as the Calamity. Mm. This was a war between the what is called the Prime Deities and the Betrayer Gods, which are two large sets of good and evil. And the net result of this, the, the cliff notes, is that there was a large portion of this world that was burnt. And there is a separation between gods and the material plane that, for safety sakes, they can't really come and walk the world as they used to. They can talk to people on it, they can have emissaries and things like that, but being a part of it is a pretty big no-no, at least for these two subsects. Mm -hmm. And after learning about the Calamity, we then move into detailed information about all of these deities. Now you're going to see a lot of names that you're going to recognize uh, from deities that exist in the typical Dungeons & Dragons universe. Um, but this being a multiverse, they do exist on different planes. So in here you're going to see them maybe with different titles, but very much the, the gods that you've come to know and love. But then also some uh, some homebrew creations uh, such as you know, Ukatoa, and uh, there's a bunch of demigods as well. So uh, even though the deities aren't able to come to the material plane, there's still plenty of them and plenty of ways for them to interact with uh, you and your players. The next section of this chapter really takes place on the material plane itself with current events on this continent. So there are three primary political powers that exist that are the the big hitters there is the clovis concord the dwendalian empire and the Crean dynasty and at the moment that this campaign setting starts the Crean dynasty and the dwendalian empire are at war and it is a big nasty looking war now the book does say 
It has some suggestions about where in the timeline of this war you want to start. Do you want to happen into it right before the war is starting? Or is it a part of your everyday life? And it also gives suggestions for how much it really is involved in the day-to-day -day operations for your characters. So it, it's got a lot of options. I know options is really the name of the game in this book. Mm -hmm. So chapter two is factions and societies. This is going to go a little bit more into detail about not just the big three players on this continent, but the factions within those political groups and some people on the outside who are trying to get their, their hands on the pie. It is a very political campaign setting. Pretty much everyone has a loyalty, has a power shift, has something they're playing for. And something I also really like about this is that there's a lot of shades of gray in here as well. Mm. There's good and evil on a lot of sides and a lot to be seen in pretty much everyone. It's like politics are complicated and you definitely get to see it in here. I think it is one uh, trap that a lot of storytellers will fall into is that uh, evil is evil and good is good. It's, it's very one side or the other. And in here you get to see how one side that you might perceive as primarily being the evil side has a couple of good people working in there and the side that you think is evil has a... Uh, that's the one I just said. You get the idea that it works on both sides. It also makes it feel very dynamic and living. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel like it breathes. And maybe that some of these people can be convinced to do things with other people. It makes it feel huge. And this is also a very big setting. Uh, this chapter is going to go into detail a little bit more about people and places and things. You're going to get NPCs in here. Mm -hmm. And I will say, as a storyteller or a game master who primarily runs uh, homebrew content, uh, I've been looking at this book as an example of how to organize my own factions and my own political structures. There's a lot of great material in there for those of you who might be wanting to do that on your own. It is hyper dense and it is hyper clean. I admit the organization is just very stunning. You sit there and you're just kind of looking at it and going, oh my god. There's so many people. They have so many thoughts. Uh, this is one of those chapters that is really dense. It's got a lot. It's For being got a as lot. short as it is, it is very dense. And it's something we're really excited about. So honestly, I think you're going to see us talk about this one a little bit more in some future videos. So chapter three is the Wild Mount Gazetteer. And this is... A really big chapter. It is a third of the book. It's really dense. Again, this really lends into the living, breathing world. This place feels huge. It feels like a continent with different places that have different people in them who behave very differently from each other. If you want any information about any location in this book, the Gazetteer is where you're going to find that. Do you want to know about uh, Kravarat, the the volcano in the frozen north? Do you want to know more about Blightshore and how it has been affected in this world? It's in this section. Each place is metered out by, it's given an introduction. Cities are given their own chunk as well within those places. You're given a population meter, so about give or take how many different kinds of races and people live in each place. And it also has an adventure hook. So if you're looking for a little short thing that pulls you into the city a little bit more, it has some suggestions in there as well. It's dense, it's thick. This is really a reminder that this book is just as long and just as in-depth as pretty much any other campaign setting that D&D has released. Now chapter three brings us into the character options. Now I know this is a place that anytime any book comes out with new character options, I just get very excited. Uh, and this one did not disappoint. First off, we get to look at um, all of the races that exist in Wildmount. Now, most of these are races that we're familiar with. Tabaxi, um, Janasi, and uh, Aarakocra, they're all in here, along with our classic human and elves. But they're a little different in that we learn how they exist here, which is very different than anywhere else. I know, for example, I was reading up on tieflings because, as I've mentioned, they're my favorite. <laughs> and they exist very uniquely within this universe, mostly because of the Calamity. So their ancestors, most tieflings are have been tieflings, their families have been tieflings for a while. So the stigma in Wild Mount is not non-existent, but less in many places, uh, or just different. Now, one new race that we get is the Hollow One, and this is something that I am 
really like. Uh, it is a way that you can see a character who has died maybe come back due to some of the horrible magics that have happened in this world. Now, as for uh, class options, we get a, a new subclass for a fighter. We get the Echo Knight, which is this crazy uh, way of creating a copy of yourself or a potential... Um, how do they refer to it? Um, a lost potential. A lost potential. This is a good moment to really go into that this is the part of the book where you start seeing Dunamancy a lot. So Dunamancy is a unique magic that exists inside this world. And it it's... focuses on uh, time and gravity and uh, kind of luck. Uh, how favor could have gone and how you can bring it back to you. Uh, so the the Echo Knight is a way that a fighter can play with Dunamancy, but then we get two new options for a wizard. We get uh, one focusing on using time and one focusing on gravity. Now this is another section in the book that we want to take more time to dive into, so we will be covering character options in its own video here in the future. So chapter five is adventures. And I know looking at this, this immediately reminded us a lot of the Ghost of Saltmarsh book. So it's got a lot of NPCs, a lot of fun mechanics, a little bit more about lots of other places, but it's also got some plot hooks and some little mini adventures that you could run as a one shot, maybe weave into your larger campaign, something that might last two or three sessions. It's a fun little chapter. Yeah, for any of you who are used to running modules before, uh, these adventures are laid out just as you would see in any other modular book. Um, but you can take them or leave them, take all of them or only do one. Really use them however you would like to see fit, whether you're using them in Wildmount or if you want to modify it for your own world. It's really immersive. It's got some really funny art involving this one guy in a mech suit that just cracks <laughs> me up every time. I really enjoy this chapter. Chapter 6 is going to bring us to the treasures of Wild Mount. Now I know for me as a storyteller, I love these sections because it is filled with things that you can reward or entice your players with. Uh, and there are going to be some familiar faces here in this uh, treasury, uh, such as the blood axe as wielded by Grog Strongjaw of Vox Machina, or the uh, Luxon Beacon as sought after by the Kryn Dynasty. They, uh, they're both in here. I'm always a sucker for the part of the book that has new shiny objects in it. It really does spark the imagination. And it's another thing that adds flavor to this universe as well. You can really get a sense for the kind of things people are making, for the kinds of things that are made by this world. And as made by this world, there is uh, the vestiges of, uh, what is it? Vestig the Divergence. Vestiges of the Divergence, which are a section of um, items, weapons, armor, uh, things that are left over from the Calamity that have a very unique uh, aspect to them that they start dormant and then they awaken and they they grow and become more powerful over time. Not necessarily because you level up, uh, but more so at the DM's discretion, maybe you have just unlocked its dormant abilities. Chapter 7 is the Bestiary. So this is a, a familiar title to my heart. <laughs> it's got more critters that are going to inhabit this earth. It's another one of these things that just makes the universe feel a little bit more real because it's got creatures that exist specifically to this planet that have come from it. Exactly. Uh, we've got the more bounders that some of us may be familiar with, um, and I know, you know, personally, they, they I Aww. love. They're so great. Um, but one that I was very excited for that came out in this book was the Nurgalid, the giant demon toad, uh, which when I first saw this creature, um, I I wanted to put it in my own campaigns, and I did so uh, with some varying uh, success. But now actually having it and having the stats as is written by Mr. Mercer, uh, God, I'm so, so happy to have it. Um, yeah. And, and this is, again, on that note, something that you can put into other campaigns. So, yeah, these creatures really do feel natural to this world, but I don't think there's any of them in there that couldn't hop a plane or two. And that is going to do it for a very brief look at everything that comes in uh, the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. I know we've been saying it again and again, but there is so much in here. Uh... I think it is a fantastic addition to the Dungeons & Dragons library. I'm very pleased with this book. Uh, it's it's big. It's got a lot in it. It's got a lot to say. It feels very much like other modules and other universes we've seen, but also unique. 
which is always something that's very enjoyable in any D&D setting. You don't want it to just be a rehash. You want it to be something new. And with all the politics, with all the intrigue, with the deep divinity that's a part of this world, it really feels like its own thing. And as a person who does love Critical Role, this is also very satisfying to me. I know I like to collect art books and behind the scenes things for like my favorite video games and things like that. I'm that kind of nerd who wants to enjoy it on the surface level, but when I'm done, I want to go in and look at it a little bit more and see the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. <laughs> it makes me happy. It makes me fulfilled. And even outside of wanting to play in this universe myself, it also makes me feel happy as a fan. Now, before we get going, uh, if you had to pick a favorite thing out of this entire book, what do you think it would be? Ooh, you know, it's going to be a really tough call, but from a purely utilitarian standpoint, I think I'm going to pick out the wizard subclasses. Just because I feel as though arcane magic is one of those things that when you're reading the player's handbook, you get a sense that it's more vast than that initial pass at it that as a wizard you're looking so deep into the multiverse and you're constantly discovering new things and new ways to use this arcane power and new ways to tap into it that it just feels like that sense of wonder within the multiverse that's just continuing to grow and i do think those are something that can hop the, uh, into a new universe very easily uh, that is a very good pick how about you yeah i'm also having a very hard time choosing whether it be uh you know the the creature of the nergalid that i have really enjoyed trying to figure out what it was on my own uh, to the vestiges which take on a similar attribute to something that I have actually included from the very first uh, campaign setting that I wrote way back in middle school um, but I think it's actually going to come down to the way that the politics have been set up in the book um, again as someone writing their own material seeing this as not necessarily a roadmap, but as a friendly guide or a view as to how other people are writing their politics in a world and, and laying it out for other people to, uh, to take in. That has been incredibly helpful, and I'm looking forward to reading even more in depth into that. So I'm, I'm going to call that my favorite. I can't argue with that. It's really beautifully written. So if you are interested uh, in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, we highly recommend picking up a copy. Head over to your local game store uh, when you can to pick one up. Uh, one thing we may not have mentioned is... Uh, in addition to everything else in the far back here, there is a full map that uh, you get to pull out from the book. So uh, it is definitely worth the uh, the price, and you're going to be happy with uh, what you get. So I think that's been a fun video there. Yeah. So I'm Emmy. And I'm Scott. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, hit that like button uh, and subscribe to our channel for more content. Remember to hit the bell icon so that you can be notified of when a new video comes out. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch more videos, you can click here uh, and also over here. So yeah, thank you all so much and we will see you at the next one. Bye! Bye.